Welcome everyone to the first keynote session of this Global Leadership Lab Immersion on the theme of developing self. We have folks from all over the world joining us on Hopin, YouTube and Facebook. My name is Pral and I'm an Atlas Co-Fellow from Uganda serving at Advocates for Youth. I am very excited to be today's session moderator and have the pleasure to speak with our amazing guest. Before we kick off, here's a quick reminder that our Atlas Core team will be monitoring the chat on each of these platforms so use it to ask questions to our keynote speaker. To make things easier, start your comment with a letter Q, say where you're from and ask your question. We'll get back to it at the end of today's event. To warm us all up a little bit, here's an icebreaker question for everyone. If you had a chance to change one thing in the world with a snap of your fingers, what would it be? While you let us know in the comment section, let me introduce today's guest. Bijan brings broad international experience to the role of CEO. He comes to Atlas Core from Save the Children Senior Executive Team, reaching more than 40 million children in more than 100 countries worldwide. He also served as an interim CEO in 2019 and led the organization's biggest global efforts to hire, develop, and retain hundreds of talented experts from countries across the globe. Bijan also worked as a strategy officer at the World Bank and was part of the team that started Teach First Deutschland, which is a partner of the Teach for All Global Network. Bijan has given lectures at the US Department of State and the United States Institute of Peace. He studied at Yale and Dodtown University and holds a Master of Public Policy from the Hearty School in Berlin. Bijan grew up in the American sector of West Berlin as the son of an immigrant from Iran and a German mother. He currently lives with his wife and daughter in the Washington DC area. Today, Bijan is going to share some leadership lessons on leading with vulnerability and empathy. Welcome, Bijan. Thank you very much, Pearl. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much. We're all very excited to have you as you, you know, you're just in your first month as the CEO. Well, less than a month anyway. And yeah, we have some great responses to the icebreaker question. But in the meantime, Bijan, if you had a chance to change one thing in the world with a snap of your fingers, what would it be? I think it would be breaking down walls. I, I grew up in a city that was surrounded by walls and I'm, I'm against walls, uh, both uh, literal walls and then the walls in people's heads. Amazing. That's that's. I feel like in tune with everything that you are because um, from everything that you've shared from when you joined the Atlas Core community, that is exactly what you have embodied. And we're very excited to delve deeper into that today. I hope you're excited because I know we are and so many people across the world have been looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, I am very excited. Awesome. So I'd like to start us off today by asking about the very beginnings of your leadership journey long before you took on the position of Atlas Core CEO. Back in the day, at the age of 18, you served in a hospital in Germany. In your recollections from your time, you wrote, and I quote, it felt like serfdom, more than a full year's life stolen from a young and self-declared overachiever, doing lowly paid repetitive work at the very bottom of the hierarchy, next to people who I had arrogantly declared below my intelligence. I think many of us can relate to that, being young and proud, ready to conquer the world, but having to start somewhere. Tell us a bit about that time in your life. What were you like? What did you think your future would look like? How did your outlook on leadership change since then? Of course, you know, uh, if you remember the time when you were a high school student and you really wanted to be out there conquering the world and then Instead of, uh, instead of going to university, I needed to show up for 13 months at this uh, service. Um, and I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be at a university. I wanted to be traveling globally. And I had to, had to go to that hospital and do uh, very uh, low uh, and repetitive work, as you mentioned. And it felt like, you know, I, I, what, what, how can I get through this year? I, I should be somewhere else. I should be doing really important stuff. And I little did I know how much I would learn about humility, empathy, about organizations. And looking back, this was a transformative year that I went through. And one of the most important takeaways, I think, is that it starts with you. Regardless in which environment you are, in which organizations, 
you can you have to focus on leading yourself first before doing anything else i love that focusing on leading yourself before leading anybody else because you can't lead from a position of um lack of self-awareness so it's important to first of all get onto your journey and then it will be much easier for you to get into any other space be it on a local level on a regional level on a continent level or even globally as we aspire to do here at atlas core so uh you've mentioned that you joined this uh position at an early age and you experienced working in an environment where one could feel the dissonance between mission vision values and daily reality you talk about the toxic hierarchical culture the lack of diversity and frequent behaviors that you would later understand to be microaggressions tell us how did working in such conditions influence you personally and when did you realize what was going on yes so think of yourself as a young person who has never experienced uh seeing death seeing pain seeing you know people suffering and being in an organization that is made to serve those people but realizing everybody is focused on their own and they're in a hierarchy they are treating themselves badly and you know the people with power are using their power in in my opinion in the wrong way and and being in that environment and and one of the things i realized what that was that very quickly you become part of that environment without noticing you start adapting and adopting to that environment and 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 become part of that and that's that's toxic in itself because it changes who you are and what your values are and i realized that at a very specific moment during that year where i had become more cynical and you know had abided by those rules and then i was in the um pre operating room with an um a, a woman i had met who had her second leg amputated and i looked at her getting her ready for that operation to get her second leg amputated and she was scared you could see how scared she was in that moment and i basically touched her and hold her hand held her hand and for the first time uh she she smiled at me and i realized this was the first time in many months that i had actually shown empathy again to a person and it really reminded me why we are here in this organization who we should really align to serve and so i take away a few lessons and many of them can later in the years looking back and reflecting on that um experience which are what's really important is am i myself in this organization can i bring my entire diversity and what i can offer to an organization and that's both as a staff when you choose and as a leader in an organization and the second one is um can i really share how i feel can i manage my emotion and share my emotions with others and am i able to to tell other people who i'm working with um how i feel and how does how does it impact them and the third one really and you mentioned this in your question is can we lead the organization any organization to be aligned on the people we serve is everybody working toward the same goal together not in silos not against each other but to serve that woman in that case that really deserves our care and that's how i want to lead and how i want to grow organizations and be part of cultures that's absolutely incredible looking at how you were able to build all of that from a situation that i'm sure many social change leaders across the world can relate with sometimes it feels like toilet work or it feels like things that are beneath us but i think you've explained it so clearly and i hope that you know this story touches so many other people because at the end of the day we all have our own stories like this in our lives we just simply have to open our eyes and see it and then work towards making that the norm so whether it is with the mission the vision and it, and how organizations are run if that is the basis then i think we can experience so much change and impact across the world thank you so much for sharing that um so you worked at self the children when the global pandemic hit last year this crisis brought many challenges to the organization and the sen senior leadership that you are part of 
Could you tell us a little bit about this time, the difficult choices you had to make and lessons learned from this chapter of your career? When I, when I think of what I feel about that period, the first feeling is pride and, and pride and, and, you know, humility because of the people I work with. And um, just, just go back one year, right? I was in, in endless Zoom meetings with mothers of small children in, in my team who were trying to manage with their husbands and partners the, the enormity of caring for their own children and schooling them at home while responding to the biggest crisis we had faced as an organization and the globe has faced. And these, these colleagues of mine were working tirelessly and especially the people who are closest to children where we worked globally did an amazing job. It changed, you know, I think it changed our understanding of how we should lead going forward. The old ways of leading and telling people what to do, in my opinion, are over. Because what the crisis showed us, we can't travel there. We can't get people into one room. So what you can do as a leader is you have to get people to follow and to you have to be able to influence and you have to win over with ideas and you have to coach people and get out of people's way and help them achieve what they need to do without being in the same place. I think it really challenged some leadership notions that were existing. And I think we need to continue to change them. Be a coach, serve, how can you help? That's what stays with me. And I think there is another point that became really important to me in my own growth because I really struggled during that period myself. I was overworked. I didn't take enough care of myself. And only by sharing that and by sharing with my team that I am overwhelmed, especially with my close senior team, I basically went to them and said, I need your help. I don't know how to do this because we needed to restructure. We didn't know what would happen. We had to cut. And at the same time, people were working 24 seven to respond. And I felt really strongly about doing the right thing, but I didn't have the answer. And when I opened up and shared and was vulnerable to my team, it was not comfortable. But when I did, they re responded like I had never imagined they would. They showed up, they suggested solutions, they came closer together as a new senior team and basically helped me walk through that crisis. And at the end of it, we had as a department, as my entire team and as the leadership team, higher engagement scores from our staff, even though we went through a really difficult time. And I think it had to do with being vulnerable, asking for help, sticking together, the things you should always do, but especially in times of crisis. I absolutely love that, especially the point regarding leading with ideas, getting out of the way, because... For sure, for the longest time, being a leader, being a boss, being a CEO, being on the management team meant we are first in the door. We're the ones who know what's best. And all of a sudden, we were presented with a reality where that could not happen anymore. And look at how we've adapted. So for sure, even after the pandemic ever ends, it should be important for us to continue with these ideals because they serve us better and it does not help us in any way to go back to things that were not serving us. Absolutely. Of course, you also mentioned something that you have been very intentional about, and that is the topic of this keynote discussion, whereby leaders need to be vulnerable because that with being vulnerable, then people can truly see you and not just, you know, issuing orders, but really getting to understand the human being in between. And I think that can transform teams and how teams work together. So that is absolutely amazing. And we are super proud of the work that you did while you had saved the children, especially throughout the pandemic. When one thinks of a leader, as I had mentioned, sorry. I'm proud of my colleagues. <laughs> Absolutely, the whole team is amazing and we are very glad to have a chance to work with you as well. And I'm sure they miss you, but it is now our turn to enjoy this amazing um, experience that you have. Um, so as mentioned, when one thinks of a leader, boss, CEO, the image that comes to mind is often a hard headed, decisive character that knows what's best for their team and doesn't show weakness when addressing challenges. You, however, often mention listening, vulnerability, asking for help, and emotional intelligence as core characteristics of a true leader. 
tell us more about your vision for leadership and how you have been employing it in your life. This is a wonderful question. And I think I want to start with the notion of uh, decisive versus not decisive. I think we have different notions in our head that decisive means I make decisions without you. And I think you can be decisive by including people. It doesn't mean that you don't make decisions. It's just you make them in a different way and you involve people and you get information and you learn from others before you make decisions. There are, of course, moments when you have to decide and that's, you know, that's the role that's the roles uh, leaders are in to make decisions, but how they make decisions is very important. I think of uh, leadership, um, and there's a there are some definitions that I really like. Is leadership is what happens after you're gone. It's you know what what people do when you are not around, either when you're not around in a room, or what happens after you have left an organization, because people think. And I've done that myself with some of the female leaders that I've worked for. In fact, for the last 15 years, I only had female bosses. And, and some of them, I think, I still think, what would she do? And I think that's a very good way of thinking about leadership is that you try to emulate, you try to, you try to think about what that person would do in your moment, in that moment in time. And so that's how I want to lead. And that's over time. And I've learned a lot myself. That's um, what I want to work on for people to actually think, what would Bijan do in this situation when he's not around anymore? And I think that would be a test to um, having been successful as a, as a leader. One other thing that I wanted to share, especially because I know there are very uh, young leaders who are starting out their career and starting to manage teams. I made all kinds of mistakes in the beginning. And you know, this is these are things I'm still working on. For example, when you when you don't know what to do, in my first role as a director, I did not ask for help. And that was a huge mistake because it put more and more pressure on myself. I have to figure out the structure, I have to figure out the people, I have to figure out the strategy. And I spent months trying to figure it out myself. And I realized I was failing. And only when I opened up and asked for help and involved people, actually, they became part of it. And that made all the difference. And that's a lesson uh, that was really hard to learn because it's not easy to, to share that you need help. But it's one of the best lessons that I've learned so far. I love that. And you're absolutely right, because a lot of times young leaders will spend a lot of time, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel when even if you're not in a traditional organization, there are so many people in the network, whether it's from, you know, LinkedIn or people, you know, generally in your life, it could be your sibling, it could be a colleague from a previous workplace. So we are wasting a lot of time reinventing the wheel, yet we could get a tool quite easily and, you know, just jump to the next step. So I absolutely love that you mentioned that. Um, I totally love what you said about leadership being what happens when you're not around. Because at the end of the day, you are not an um, you're not a soldier who's there to oversee people. You're there to just impact a sort of style and teach people and inspire them so that when you're not around, um, they're able to do the kind of thing that you would have done or that you taught them. Not that they're doing it because you are watching over them. I love that. So we've talked a lot about your experiences up until now and the things you have learned. And I imagine our listeners are keen to find out what is yet to come. What is next for Bijan Nashad and what is next for Atlas Core? That's a great question. So first of all, uh, what's next for me, this is the organization. This is the organization I want to lead, I want to be part of, and this is the community and the movement that I want to make a difference with and with your help. One of the things I am so passionate about, also coming out of COVID and seeing that organizations need to change, is to really enable leaders, young leaders, to get that opportunity to grow and you know thrive in all of these organizations and make a difference. I've seen far too many people not being able to get that opportunity for all kinds of reasons that um, we all know of. But here we are. We can make a difference. So I really want to say, 
if Scott hadn't started Atlas Core 15 years ago and brought that wonderful team and community together, it would have to be started today because we have to overcome those barriers to opportunities. The challenges that we're facing are just way too big. So what's next for me in Atlas Core? I am still in that listening mode. I have lots of ideas, but I really intently want to continue to listen for a bit longer. That's the biggest advice I've gotten from my bosses, from my coach. Listen, 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 and then only form uh, an opinion and hypothesis. And what's next is at the beginning of the year, and I say that with the pride that the team deserves for, for working through this period and coming out with this amount of success through COVID, we have to give ourselves time to engage on what will Atlas Core 2.0 look like? And let me say this again, this will not work if there's a team of 10, 15 people that's trying to figure this out. This will only work if the community is part of it. My conversations with the alumni community and with the fellows and scholars show me how much energy and potential and reach we already have. So one of the things I am really thinking about, if not to say meditate, is everything is already there. We have to activate it, we have to energize it, and we have to bring it together. And Atlas Core will be able, if we look back in 10 years time, will be able to make a significant contribution to those challenges that we're facing globally. I believe in that very strongly. And I really want to invite you to be part of that journey with the team, with me, and as part of this community. I love that, absolutely. And as an Atlas Core Fellow, and I'm sure other fellows and scholars and alumni that are watching across the world, absolutely agree because if you've been a part of this journey, then you know that we have the capacity to make big change in big ways. And we're glad that you're now at the top of the helm and we can't wait to see what we do together as a community. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left, so we shall use them to take a couple of um, advice from you. If you were to give us three pieces of advice for all rising global leaders watching us right now, what would they be? Three is really hard, but, but I will try. So I really want you to know that developing self is the start of everything and it never stops. I am working on conflict management. How am I, you know, how am I doing, how am I managing conflicts? How am I managing my emotions? How do I feel about a situation and what do I take from it? So that developing self looking at how you feel managing your emotions as a leader, why is this happening right now? What, what should I do? What have I learned about situations like this before? is really, really key. Focus on that. That will help you grow and it never stops. The second one is when you look for organizations, my advice is look for people you want to work for, not necessarily for the shiny organizations or the shiny titles. Look for bosses you can learn from and who inspire you, who you want to be at, at one point in time. There's a, there's a saying that goes, uh, people join organizations and they leave bosses. And I think that's true. So look out for the people who, who you can learn from and you will be a better leader, a better person, and you will grow in your career. That's my experience. And lastly, ask for advice. You know, be part of a community, seek mentorship, seek coaching, seek people out there who can help you grow and build that self-awareness that no one is perfect at any moment in time and do so with self-compassion. The only way to really grow is being self-compassionate. Beating up yourself about failure does not help anyone. Actually, there's really good research that it doesn't help anyone. It actually holds you back. Be passionate with your, be compassionate with yourself, show kindness to yourself and show kindness to others. I think that would be the last thing I would advise if I only have three. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe, you know, you could write a blog on the Atlas Co website and share with us any more details if you have them. I absolutely love the three that you've shared, but I will mostly focus on the second one to look for people you want to grow into or to learn from versus organizations. Because I believe many times, many young leaders from the, you know, across the world will sort of, you know, not give as much value to homegrown organizations, yet you can find that there are great leaders who are doing amazing work in there, who have so much experience and so much value to add to their leadership journeys. And so if we focus more on what we have within our spheres of influence, I think we could go a long way instead of waiting, you know, for that big opportunity in that big organization. And I absolutely love that. So um, let's have a look at some of the questions that we have from social media and all the different platforms that people are tuned in from. Um, Gael is saying, I'm glad you mentioned the importance of reaching out to your senior coworker when you overworked and felt overwhelmed. The outcome is so worth it. They supported you, great way to show vulnerability in the midst of crisis. Sorry, I've started with the comments from the earlier discussions that we've been having. Uh, Chibonu says, wow, leadership is what happens when you are not around. And Avas is saying Bijan is a court making machine today. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we have a question from Marta from Poland. You are a very passionate person. How do you maintain work-life balance when there's so much to be done at all times? Yeah, uh, Marta, that's a great question. And I really struggled with this because especially those of us who are joining organizations that you know serve others, especially in a humanitarian environment, it's really easy to give up yourself because you believe in the mission and you want to give everything. And it's taken me uh, years to figure out that I need to come first. My health and my wellness and how I am comes first. I learned that the hard way last year again. And I took an entire week last in June of last year because I needed a break. And what I did, and everybody needs to figure out how they do this. What I did was a lot of exercise and sports and, and, and really get everything out of your system. And that's what I do regularly. But the other thing that really helps me was writing about another crisis that I experienced as a leader. And that was much worse actually than what I was experiencing. I think many people have experienced death even in the workplace and having to deal with that. And I wrote about it and it helped me reflect in that situation, how I am and what's important as a leader. And it brought it back to being kind to yourself, trying to be there for others and your job changes. You're the chief caring officer instead of you know anything with executive. And so that notion of empathy to yourself and to others is really strong. Create boundaries, create boundaries around your work, you know, secure the boundaries for the loved ones and spend time with them. It will make you a better leader in those organizations. I love that, uh, being kind to yourself and others, putting yourself first when you need to and having boundaries because those are very key things that, again, young social leaders across the world struggle with with you know the heart for making change it's hard sometimes to know when to step back and care for yourself but at the end of the day you cannot pour from an empty cup thank you for that so we have a question from asma from tunisia how do you keep your motivation high because leadership journeys have ups and downs and sometimes we get discouraged and we feel that we are losing our purpose everybody everybody experiences that you know, and the better you get to know yourself, the more you are prepared for what are the moments and the environments when I am not at my best or when it takes me a lot of energy to go through, right? Um, submitting your invoices and, 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 you know, having really hard conversations. But that's to me, um, they will always be there first accepting that. Not everything, you will never be on a, on a permanent high. This is part of it. As it is in relationships with your family, you are in those moments, accept it. Acceptance is the first step. And the second one is to treat it as a learning opportunity. Are there ways I can make this easier? Can I ask people to help me who are better at this? Can I ask for advice? And 
accepting that it happens, finding ways to do it better, like you do in sports, right? You practice things in order to get better at them and you know what you're good at and where you need to strengthen things and just seeking out that as a learning opportunity. But I will say it, it remains hard and it doesn't change. So that's part of leading yourself and others. I love that, especially the part, you know, it, it remains hard. You just maybe get better doing it. And, and the part that you mentioned about practice, I think a lot of times we don't treat things like leadership the same way we would, let's say, a skill or a hobby. So you'll find, you know, you're running 10,000 kilometers per week, but what are your kilometers looking like in your leadership journey and how you, you know, envision it? At the beginning of the, the GLL today morning, we were talking about how you describe yourself. And it's very telling how people describe themselves. A lot of people mentioned that they don't even know how to describe themselves. So it starts with those small things. And then building with that over time, I think, can really be helpful. And of course, like you added, that having a way to make it easier. How can you make it easier even when you know it's still going to come anyway? So thank you so much. That is very insightful. And Personally, I will use that because sometimes it looks like, you know, there's nothing going on and there's no point in fighting on any harder. But I think words like yours inspire many of us across the world. Thank you so much. So we have a question from Gael from Madagascar. Reaching out to people when you do not know things is something I learn constantly, especially now that I am in a new culture. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable for me, though. Have you ever felt that way? What did you do? You know, my first work experience uh, was uh, working with the German parliament and I, I felt very new. I didn't have lots of experience. I was just starting to, to study at, at university. And so at the end of three months, you know, working for free and living at home again, I went to my manager and, and showed him my, my CV and said, do you have any advice for me? What should I do differently? And it took, it took some courage. And this is over 20 years ago. And the only thing he said was, don't you want to consider changing your name? Because your name doesn't sound German. And, you know, people might not want to hire you because they don't, they don't think you're really German. And you will, I mean, many of you have had those and, and worse experiences. It is a test. It is a test for you to, first of all, believe in who you are and really build the identity of, I might be a bit different but I bring something that you cannot bring to this environment and you are not aware of, and I will show you. And, and so, so I think it takes courage in these situations. It's still taking me courage sometimes to show up and you know to just, um, uh, there are always times when you feel uncomfortable, especially in new situations. But I think it's a little bit like jumping into a pool as a, chi as a child, right? You, you just, you know, you know how good it feels afterwards because you've done it. And it is, Pearl, as you say, it is like practice. You just have to jump into the pool. And what's, and the, the one thing that I ask myself all the time is, what is the worst thing that can happen here? And usually it's somebody looks at you funny. And if that, that's all it is, given, you know, all the situations other people are facing, let other people look at you funny. It's going to help you grow. I love that. And I mean, at the end of the day, sometimes are you even sure they're looking at you funny? Because sometimes we're, you know, projecting our own feelings onto other things. But absolutely, you know, just sitting with it and knowing that not everyone is going to give you a thumbs up. But when they do, it could be the game changer that you've been looking for. I love that. So we have a question from Claudel. How can a leader influence his community for change? The big question. <laughs> well, um, I think, uh, Claudel, I think you need to be prepared for my answer on listening. I, um, you need to understand. You need to, and, and it's not just listening for, for, for words or writing down words. It's really trying to get a, a feel for what the community is about. What are the values of that community? What is the why of that community? Who are the people in the community? And that might take a little bit of time, but I, I really, I, some of the mistakes I made earlier in, in, in some roles is that I thought, you know, when you come out of graduate school and you, 
you know, all the theories and you've read all of it. And then you, you know, I've read this, let's try one, two, three. And it doesn't work. You have to understand who the team is, who the community is, who the organization is, who your culture is uh, that you're working in before you can try to bring around people and try to get them to change with you. That's, to me, that's the entry point for everything. And everything else follows from that. I love that. And it's something that you mentioned in one of the media pieces that you wrote for save, while you were still at Save the Children. And the whole idea that you had to reimagine and you still had to come in and address the, the crisis that was happening over there. Because many times we are so full of our great ideas from the big universities and the big you know, certificates that we've studied and we want to implement them there. But understanding the community and the challenge from the eyes of people who will be benefiting from the alleged solution that you have makes all the difference. And so if those are aspects that are followed, it is so easy to achieve change because at the end of the day, you've consulted the community and they're on board saying, yes, this is exactly what we need to address ABC. I love that. Pearl, can I add one more thing? Because I know we're coming to the end. I'd really like to invite the community and everyone to be part of this journey. And to ask yourself, look back from 10 years from now, the biggest crisis we have are facing in this century, where do you want to have been? What do you want to have contributed to? And my answer is, I think Atlas Core can make an amazing contribution to making the world a better place by doing what we're doing, creating opportunities for young leaders and talented people from all over the world to do to work on critical social change. That's what I want to do and that's how I want to look back. And I invite you to do the same and be part of this journey. I love that. I know that um, for sure I will be on this journey with you and I'm very, very excited. And I'm sure many young social change leaders across the world are as excited. Uh, we still have some more questions. Uh, Chibonu from Nigeria is saying, are there times as a leader you had conflicts of interest with your team and it seemed they wanted to frustrate all your efforts. How did you handle it such as the team didn't break up? The answer is yes, Chibonu. I, uh, many times. And one of the lessons I'm, I'm taking away and I'm trying to learn is when you hit a conflict moment, the most important conflicts are around values. They always go back to values. So be very clear what your values are, what the organization's values are, and how you balance values that might be in conflict. And for example, if you know one part of the organization or a team member just wants to be out there to do something that he or she thinks is right, have a conversation how it impacts the others, what it means for the value of team co cooperation, for achieving goals together with empathy, with respect. That's the conversation you need to have in order to open up where people are coming from. Because the majority of people come from a good place, but they may, may not see it the same way you do. And values are a very good way to have a conversation around. I love that. And I totally agree because I think at the end of the day, if you're on a team with somebody, that means there's something that already brought you together. And so perspective can be the thing that's standing in the way from all of us. And as you're always saying, you know, the more we listen, the more likely we are to find a shared purpose and shared goal. So I absolutely love that. Coyote from Nigeria is saying, from my discussions with Bijan, he's an intense listener. Wow. Sometimes I get disconnected from discussions. How are you able to listen qualitatively or listen to connect with the person you're listening to? I know I want to hear the answer to this question. Kayori, I appreciate you saying that. I, I'm still learning and it's easy, right? It's, it's really easy to get distracted, especially nowadays where everything is online. I'm still learning. I'm still learning, but I, um, what helps me is to focus on the person and to look at the person if I can see the person and to um, step back and, and listen between the lines. I try to do that sometimes. What is, the, what is the no feel and do of this conversation? 
There is something the person wants to tell me in terms of knowledge. There is something the person makes me feel and feels themselves. Can I, can I listen into that? What's behind what the person is saying? What's the feeling I am sensing? And is there something the person would want me to do differently? And I try to be guided by these three points when I'm listening. But having said that, I'm still learning. It's practice. I love that. And I think, you know, it's safe to say practice is one of the key words we are taking out of this conversation. Uh, we have a comment from Gael. I'm definitely getting so many beautiful things out of this session. Thank you so much, Bijan, for your wisdom and Paul for your phenomenal facilitation skills. Wow. I love your energy and positive vibes. You see, the problem with not practicing receiving compliments, you end up even losing your voice. Thank you so much, Gail, for that lovely comment. <laughs> We're all practicing something here today. Um, yeah, so we have to watch the clock. So, Bijan, if you have any final remarks that you'd like to share with us, please go ahead so that we can conclude this session and continue with the Global Leadership Lab Immersion. Thank you so much, Pearl, for a wonderful session and for a wonderful moderation. It was great to meet you in person, which is rare these days. So I look forward to many more engagement with you and the communities, hopefully with travel at some point, because the only way we can be a community that has an impact is if we stay connected. And I don't just mean connectivity in terms of access to an internet. That's really important. Connected means you share values, you share experiences, and you grow together. And that's how we have impact. And so I really invite everyone to stay connected. I, I will not be able to you know, spend all of my week listening because at some point we need to get going. But what I commit to is to always keep open opportunities to reach out to me, to the team, because we are a small organization, but we can have big impact if you are part of this community. So I really invite you to join that journey with us for changing and for responding to the huge, huge crises and challenges that are in front of us. I know I had said, you know, that you're giving your final remarks, but kindly allow me to ask a follow up with everything that you've said and knowing that we have 15 years behind us. We have the big celebration coming up in November. Where do you imagine Atlas Co in the next 15 years? There is one thing that I believe in, and it is that there is so much talent out there that I've met in person in many countries I've traveled and colleagues I've worked with, we have not even seen the tip of the iceberg what talented leaders in countries far across the globe can do. And I see Atlas Core as the organization to build great leaders, to be really rigorous to, on leadership development, measuring that it works, bringing people together who otherwise wouldn't have that opportunities and changing organizations. I've worked in organizations who need talent like you in order to grow, to get better. The, the market for this challenge is out there. We just need to find the right way to engage, to open those opportunities, to give people experience to grow, measure it, prove it, and we will have an amazing success. I see Atlas Core having amazing success over the coming years, but it will only work if you're part of it. Thank you so much, Bijan. And thank you everyone for joining us today for another Leadership Journey session of the Atlas Co Global Leadership Lab. Make sure to follow, to follow us on Facebook and YouTube for more engaging content like this. My name is Pearl and our guest today was our very own Bijan Nashat, the CEO of Atlas Co. Make sure to join us tomorrow at the same time for another Leadership Journeys call, this time with Juliana Santos Walgren from ENAR, the European Network Against Racism. Also visit apply.atlascore.org apply to learn about ongoing recruitment for Atlas Core programs. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much, Vijan, and thank you, everyone. Bye.